Mushia for Joshua Mapunga Edin Komobi. Na Nkoma Odi a brofo. So this video is going to be international because in Kofumi be na be T a video we are several. Na Joshua Mapunga a will be on of free ASM Zimbabwe. E tina or your prophet who no no so can a ye a sorry T any sign of no can no a part of it. Se say ya ye can say one part of it be him. E tina Nkoma Odi no a na or expose a lot of a ye religious a and slavery na a woman. A quire a soft one be a timmy fasso, a de religion no a bunk or four a fasso. O di a hunk or more over the pages so pa. It is Joshua Punga, a e baby dinko mobi, si say ya ye can say. A de a fat a ye religion in a quire more fasso, a ye or more one or two be near the adeno. Now before that, no, a map minim so I mean, if you watch a lot of videos and episodes from Joshua Mapunga on my platform, ah, my post two a woman page in a suda, obit me a quack or te wose me catch her once we bet ma follow me page we bet ma subscribe to my channel for more videos anyway yen ko ne ko tie juwe mo punga ensem wo kan ye abra wo tena ase na odi nkomo ne nkomo a odi nso no ko straight 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 we bet ma share na fa comment bra be din e de corner ba which becomes the study of god the study of deity is there a god out there what is he what color is he what shoes does he put on uh, what material is he made out of? But again, if you read the Bible and use it as a basis of study, you will come to understand that theology is outside of scope of the biblical text because the Bible does not try to prove the existence of God. For the one who begins the beginning must be there before the beginning begins. Therefore, the Bible does not tell us of the beginning of God. Rather, it tells us of the beginning of humankind. If you are to use the Bible, as your basis of your anthropological study to the existence of man. Your initially, first subject is that of theology. Where is he? Where does he stay? And what does he look like? And we can only begin to have some surmising ideas as we find him in the greater biblical text appearing in various forms. Some places he appears as an angel, some places he appears as a burning fire, some places he appears as a cloud, some places he appears as a voice. And then in the New Testament apparently appears as a human being in the person of Yeshua, in the person of Christ. Then after the going away of Christ, then he appears as a, as a Holy Spirit, as a spirit that occupies and works with human beings. I, I want to clear something because I want to build a bridge between the greater African perception of, of, of spirituality and the biblical perception of spirituality. So the first one that we need to start addressing is the idea of theology. What is God? Who is God? When is he? Why is he? And what is he made out of? And after you've discussed the first element, which is actually the theology itself, you move over to the next item. You will need these knots, by the way. Take them very seriously, because the next shows that we're going to be running where we're discussing decolonization, you need to have this information so that you can inform yourself. When the day I put my guest here and I begin to roast them and asking them questions of decolonization, at least let me make you a top student, because I want you to be ahead of the class. By the time people are talking, at least you know where we are going. So the first one we are dealing with is actually the theological part. What is theology? What is this concept of God all about? What is Gainyame all about? What is Nkulunkulu all about? Mkulu What is Mwari all about? Mdimu Ramasedi. What is this? What is this? invisible idea which is in the sky which we call god or it is in the air or it is in the waters or it is inside us or it is in the graves i don't know but you need to firstly address the issue of theology after theology item number two is anthropology anthropology therefore is not discussing humanity in terms of demographic they're dispersing on the continent dispersing on the face of the earth but we're asking anthropology in terms of the nature of man what is the nature of man what is human what is humanity what are human beings made out of right now as you are seeing me sitting here what are you looking at and from our academic institutions we have been told that a human being is made out of the body is made out of the mind is made out of the emotions and is made out of the spirit then some people walk up to me and say, and they step on me and say, Maponga J, don't take it personally. Hey, hey, don't start with me. I take everything personally. Because when you step on me physically, I feel the pain physically. 
it i react emotionally and after emotion i think spiritually and i react back to you physically therefore when you talk to me you're not talking to me schizophrenically that you can say oh well i'm just talking to your brains your emotions must not be affected and your, your body must not be aff hey, hey, hey. to me everything is personal because when you talk to me you're talking to the entire me and i myself and i all of us get affected from my brains to my emotions, to my spirituality, and my physicality. But anthropology then discusses, if we say God created man, second question, and he created man in his own image, then what is humanity? What is a human being made out of? What nature, what texture is a human being? How long does he live? What does he eat? What does he drink? And here we are again, finding ourselves in various conversations with various philosophers who are all of them struggling to explain the human nature of man. What causes umuntu, utabengu muntu? And when you don't have umuntu, ubayinto. In other words, for you to be a human being, you must be human kind. Listen carefully. Therefore, you must be kind to humanity. Then you become human kind. That, that makes human, becoming a really human being. And so when you find this concept and this idea, this concrete object, physical, you call a human being, what is he made out of? And immediately you ask the question of anthropology. You are not only discussing life before birth. You are discussing life after birth. You are also discussing life after death. Remember, there's a ceremony that is done before you are born. Uh -huh. It's getting exciting now. There's a ceremony that is done by your parents before you are born. There's another ceremony that is done when you are being born. There's a ceremony that you do when you are living your life. There's a ceremony that is done when you die. And so you need to understand that coming in here, you were welcomed into this world. And the day you go away from this life, we say goodbye to you. And if a human being is alive before birth, we must also discuss a human being might be alive after, after death. The question is, what is the nature of humanity? And if you are to use the Bible again as your text, it will tell you the day you die, your body goes back into the ground and the spirit goes back to the one who has created it. I like that part there. We may come back there and break our teeth as we discuss Christianity that wants to say human beings are dead, are dead. And we don't know we, we, they are dead. They're down, they're down, they're down. The same Bible you are reading says when you die, your body goes to the ground, but the spirit goes back to the one who has created it. And in the whole biblical text, you find actually the presence of familiar spirits and unfamiliar spirits. What do all these things mean? So the first one is theology. The second one is anthropology. And number three is an item we call Christology. Christology. This is where the problem is. Christology discusses Christ, the Messiah concept. Who is this Messiah? What is he made out of? They say he's 100% human. They say he's 100% God. Therefore, if he's 100% human, then he must be one with us. And remember one thing. If we say Christ is God who was born as man, then we need to give him a culture. We need to give him a name. We need to give him a mother. We need to give him a history. We need to give him a father. We need to give him a geography. Some people then say, I don't care whether Jesus is white or he's black. You better be worried. Because if Jesus is neither black or white, then he was never a human being. If he is a human being born on this earth, is he Paddy? Is he Zulu? Is he Shona? Is he Lemba? Is he Kikuyu? Is he Ibo? Is he Hausa? Is he, what is he? If we cannot just wake up in the morning and say, I don't care, as long as Jesus died for me, don't get excited unnecessarily because your mind has been brainwashed beyond recognition. If he is a human being, then we need him in a texture of skin. And while you are thinking about his texture of skin, go back and find out the geography and the history in which the Messiah is born. If he was born in Europe, then he must be white. If he was born in China, then he must be Chinese. If he was born in, in America, then he must be Red Indian. But if he was born in Africa, then we need to start discussing how come a black Jesus comes back to Africans as a blue-eyed boy with a blonde hair. And the boy looks so soft, man, I don't think he can even kill a fly. And he's supposed to be the savior of the world. This is Jesus, the son of God, who has died for our sins. And uh, we must believe in him and we must be saved. 
I don't have a problem with that. But if you go to the shop and you buy a can of Coca-Cola and you get home, it's all written Coke, Coke, everything. When you get home, Udu, I push a can, you find it's stony or it's cream soda. First thing is you drink it <laughs> because you have memorized the color of Coke. Udu, <laughs> how? <laughs> how come this does not taste like Coca-Cola? Because what you were sold and what you are now testing are two separate things. For that reason, therefore, we cannot walk around, we go buying a, a, a white Jesus only to discover on the inside is actually a black Messiah. And the opposite is true. You cannot sell us a black Messiah with the Bible, then give us a white Messiah in terms of iconography. I want us to go through some of these issues because it is in discussing some of these things openly and frankly that we can begin to find the reason why I am talking decolonization. I'm getting back in my groove. So the first thing we study here is theology. What is God? Second thing we study is anthropology. What is man? What is man in relationship to his God? And the third thing that we study is Christology. What is Christ? What is this messianic story we're hearing about? What is he made out of? Where does he come from? And this whole thing that we hear that he is 100% God and he is 100% man, meaning to say he actually is born with us, but it is not from the human birth, but apparently uh, the, uh, the spirit of the Lord went into Mary so that you actually have a 100% divine seed that is sitting 100% in a, in a human womb to produce this. Uh, by the way, woman means womb, woman, woman womb, you know, and sitting in a human womb to produce this Messiah we call Christ. Then we study carefully the Christological issues. And when we are looking into the Christological issue, we want to establish again how much of God is in him, how much of humanity is in him, and what example can we learn from that? Then number three, number four, sorry, comes to what we call soteriology. Soteriology then is the study of salvation. How, what is the transaction? How are sinners? How are those who have erred, those who have wronged, those who have committed evil in the community, those who have done things that are inhuman in the community. The question is, how do you rehabilitate them? How does salvation ca come to them? And within the greater African space, of course, we knew this is where all the issue of paying things, when you have made a mistake in life, you have killed someone, or you have fought with your mother, or you have done something wrong, the issue of justice has always been there. The question is, when you are paying these prices of paying for your crime that you have committed, that's what you call salvation. The word salvation actually comes from the Greek word soteria. Soteria means, uh, sot or, uh, soteria and redemption is when you are in a marketplace of slaves and then you are about to buy a slave. When you buy the slave, then you, it's someone in the house, a blood brother, looks at you saying, is my 20, 20, 20, 20, 30, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 50, 60, 100, no, go, gone for 200, run to the bidder at the back. And then your blood brother comes up with the $200 and they give it to the person who is buying you and they look at you in the eye and say, you can go free. Salvation, therefore, it is the ransom. Redemption is the ransom that you pay for someone for the crimes that they would have committed. This is where cows and goats in Africa were actually being used to pay for the crimes. If your cows go and sleep in my field and they eat my corn, you have committed a crime. The question is what you pay for, that price you pay for. That's what you call a ransom. So that becomes salvation. And within the biblical text, then you discuss that there is this God we are talking about who has created humanity. And humanity needs the Messiah who becomes the mediator between humanity and God. But for them to be bought out of their crime, that's where salvation comes into the space. I'm rushing somewhere. Then you have number five, which you now call ecclesiology. That's where rubbish begins. Ecclesiastical liturgy, the issue of churches. Are churches buildings? Are churches hearts? The same Bible says, I don't dwell in houses that are built by men. I dwell in a house that I built for myself. Therefore, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, if your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, what the hell are you doing for in church? You're already in church. And Corona has actually brought this whole to light, that you don't need a building to find God. God is, God is here. I'm in church right now, right here with myself. Therefore, so the ecclesiology begins to talk about human structures that are trying to gather people together. That's where trouble begins. Because once people gather together, there are bills to pay. There's electricity to pay. There is water to pay. There's fundraising to be done. There are other issues to be done. Now people are going to be cooking theology to maintain a building.
mocking theology to maintain white structures. Is this divine? Is this biblical? Do we find any church that was built in the Bible? Or we only find a sanctuary and a temple which people would come and attend once every three years? And when they are coming to these churches, that's when they brought their tithe once every three years. And if you cannot come, please take your tithe and eat it with your neighbors. That's what the Bible teaches. But now our fund is by funa every weekend. Every weekend. I believe you do believe in Jesus. Yes. You don't believe in Jesus. Yes. Raise up your hand. And after you put your hand down, please can we have some money? Has the gospel now become a marketplace where pastors are selling hope? Selling us cities that are in the sky. Are we in a hurry to go to heaven? Are we in a hurry to go to heaven? Because we have failed to live on earth. You want to walk on the streets of gold when you get to heaven. You have ever held a bar of gold on, in your hands while you're on earth? You want to go and look after God's heaven when you cannot look after your own earth here. So the whole issue of theology becomes pastors are now selling for us a home in the sky. I have a question for you. If God wanted us in heaven, then why did he create us on earth? Why are we here? Now all of a sudden we're here discussing how and what are we going to do after we die. Who cares about what we die? Let's stop talking about the dead. Let's talk about the living. How do we live? That's why I say in my own theology, there's no man who is entitled to be having a wife before he has land. Every man must have two wives. The first wife is land. And the second wife is the one who gives children. And the first wife will help you to look after the second wife. Before you make my daughter pregnant, make sure that the land is pregnant. Because when the land is pregnant, wife number two can always eat. Therefore, God created Adam. He created Eden then Adam, then Eve. Therefore, without Eden, you don't have legal rights to be marrying Eve. For every Eve must be submitted into an Eden. And if you're an Adam and you don't have land, you don't qualify to reproduce. That's why lions, when they walk in the bush, they pee on the bushes, they pee on the bushes to mark their territory. And after they've used their urine for territory, then they use their sperm for reproduction. And there's humanity. We must learn also from the animals without territory, it is illegal to reproduce. Theology, what is it about God? Anthropology, what is it about humanity? Christology, what is it about the Messiah? Soteriology, how do we pay each other after we have committed crime? Ecclesiology, when we are gathering in church for ecclesiastical liturgies and dogma, is this a divine institution? We need to separate when you get to ecclesiology. What is the divine principle? What is the human principle? Many churches have become human institutions rather than divine connecting centers. We go to church to maintain buildings, not to maintain our own souls. And number, number six, we have what we call now eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the end time. The word eschatos and ologos. And remember, theo, ologos, I talk about God or I study about God. Anthro. Or logos, anthropos, I study about humanity. Christos, or logos, I study about Christ. Soteria, or logos, soteriology, I study about salvation. Then you come to ecclesia, or logos, I study about the church. Eschatos, or logos, and the word eschatos there is the second, the ends, the events of the end times. And as you read the word eschatology, you're actually finding the critical word there becoming a revelation. The drawing aside of a curtain so that those who are this side can see what is happening that side. That is the prophetic voice where those who are spiritually connected can see into the future and tell us in the present what is coming in the future. The eschatology speaks to us of what is happening. And we, Africans, this is not new to us. Authors, they have Bolonghaus, Zulus, in Shona, the Chaminukas, who told them that there are people coming from the seas, people who had no knees, whose hair was looking like that of Milis and etc., prophesying ahead that white people are coming. They are going to be bringing coins and they bring a book. Please take this, throw away that. Before these people came, there was already a word of prophecy telling us. Therefore, Africans cannot wait for Europeans to be telling us, I have a prophetic ministry. I have a prophetic ministry. As if you are the first one to be a prophet. Hey! Hey, we've had prophets in Africa here way before you started prophesying who I slept with last night. Even the devil was there. That's not a prophecy. That's history. If you want to talk about prophecy, you should have told us that Corona was coming. Then I would have believed you. Even now it's not too late. If you are a prophet, tell us when it will end. Look into the future and tell us if you are with God. Because the Bible says God will not do anything unless he has whispered to his prophets, to his servants, the prophets. 
So we have right now prophets who run churches. I've never seen one prophet in the whole Bible who was running a church. Prophets don't run churches. Priests are the ones who run the church. Therefore, if you want to run a church, you better behave like you are a, you are a priest and stop acting like you are, you, are, you are some prophetic little ministry that is giving us chaos on the face of the earth, ripping us off money to see you must pay money. Hey, go to work also. You are not crippled. Go to work and create your own employment and stop ripping up people and stealing from people's means and needs and selling the gospel freely. You were given freely. You must also, you must, we must also receive from you. Theology, anthropology, Christology, soteriology, ecclesiology, then eschatology, what will come at the end of time. Therefore, when you begin to look into the biblical text, you have what called apocalyptic literature. And the word apocalypsis, opening of the curtain. Therefore, apocalyptic literature will be beginning to talk about the biblical texts that are looking into the future and telling us the events that will be coming. You shall bear a son, and his name shall be called Yeshua. And you shall bear a son, his name shall be called Emmanuel. He shall be prince of peace, everlasting father. You know, no, no, that's a prophecy. Two, three hundred years before it even happens. Now, now you begin to understand that Africans are not new to the biblical text. For, for we, we, we knew and we lived this also. And the last one I'll give you on uh, systematic theology is what we call pneumatology. Pneumatology, wind theology, spirit theology. What is it with this concept of the Holy Spirit? Did not come with white people. We already had the name. Meaning to say the Africans knew there is a clean spirit and a dirty spirit. The Holy Spirit, as it is said in Shona, means the Holy Ancestor. We knew him before the colonial system came. Therefore, our concept of pneumatology, what is it when you are dreaming at night? Who are you talking to? When you sleep at night and you hear people, things that are whispering to you, what is happening? And then the other day you are walking in town and something happens and you go, oh, it looks like I was here the other day. This thing is a repeat of what is said. What is happening? And someone comes to you smiling and looking very nice and something in you says, uh-uh, uh-uh. This one, there's a problem right here. What is that? What is that? What is, what is this premonition? What is, what is this? And by the way, if there are pastors out there and papas and, and fathers and uh, uh, spiritual fathers who want to come and have a conversation here, this is your show. Pull up your socks. Put on your collar. Yes, and brush up your teeth and come. I'm ready for you. Then we can talk. This is time for Africa to talk. We've had enough time being told colonial theology. Now, we are now qualified theologians ourselves. We must unmask this little monster here and remain with what is true. When you go to the shops and you buy a loaf of bread, you eat the bread and you throw away the plastic. Huh? Therefore, when Christianity came to Africa, we need to take the content of the gospel but throw away the branding, which is European and Eurocentric. We don't have to eat the plastic. No wonder many of us are constipated with the European theological nonsense because we have eaten both the plastic and the bread. Learn to separate European culture from the biblical text. I said this the other time and people thought I'd lost my mind. Only Africans can read the Bible and understand it. The rest of them are thumb sucking and taking chances. I mean, how can you wait for a white man to tell you about Jesus? Jesus who is a senem and a totem. Ingwe nyamaka Judah of the lion, the tribe of Judah. Does a white man even have a totem? Unas is takazel. I have a totem. Now how can you say the Bible is European when even the language of the Bible in looks the European in the eye and say, what is your totem? <laughs> and he does not have it. But we would take as right, it's right. It's corner to Navagan Joe from the elephants, Avaka Panda from the lions, Avaka Piri from the Shonas, Avaka Mukwena from the crocodiles, Avaka Ungwe from the birds. We have the totem. The language of the text, therefore, tells us that this is a black text. Black text. And every text, if it does not have context, it becomes a pretext. We're here to give you a correct theological framework through which you can begin to do your own theologizing. Discussing from theological sense to theological nonsense. But the whole idea is to allow the African child to begin to reason and think like a theologian. So that when we begin to talk about deconstruction of Christianity, deconstruction of Christianity, what are we talking about? 
When you come back on top of the break, we shall start now to unpack how do we decolonize Christianity? And how has Christianity transformed itself into a political partner to become a pimp on the prostitution of the African continent and actually selling African wealth in prostitution with colonialism? Don't go away. Here are the seven questions you must ask. How do we deconstruct and decolonize God? Was he captured? How do we decolonize and reconstruct humanity? Were they captured? How do we decolonize and reconstruct Christology? Was Christ captured? How do we decolonize and reconstruct salvation? Is it now for sale? How do we deconstruct and decolonize ecclesiology? Was it captured? Are churches true venues where God can be met? And how do we decolonize and deconstruct eschatology? Are we being sold a heaven in the sky, which is making us heavenly minded and of no earthly good? And lastly, how do we decolonize and deconstruct spirituality? Is now spirituality a colonial system? And that Holy Ghost only comes when you play the organ. You, then people must, must, must know, know more wing well. the Holy Spirit has now arrived. And this whole business of people falling in church, why are you falling? Are you sick? Are you sick? Show me one person that fell, that fell because Jesus touched them and they fell. People must not get excited by confusing Africans. I get angry and I get quite unsettled because in the midst of us baptizing everything that is European, we've actually become agents of colonizing Africans. So firstly, we need to start talking about God. This picture of God, this big white man with a big beard sitting in the heavens, with a big pen in his hand and a book waiting for us to make mistakes and then he must send us to hell. Africans don't need to go to hell. We're in hell already. Stop telling about others, otherwise we're burning twice. We are, we are suffering now. We will, we will suffer again at the end. We, we might as well endure this hell or work across it and make it a paradise. We need, therefore, number one, to understand psychologically their proclivities, their proclivities, psychologically, you become affected when you begin to worship a God that does not identify with you. Follow carefully. Because when you read the Bible, he comes to set the captives free. Therefore, salvation does not identify with the oppressors. It always identifies with the oppressed. I have come so that they can have life and have it more abundantly. It is talking to those who don't have abundant life, who are living in meager resources. Those in prison. Those naked. Those with no food. Those orphans. Those widows. Those slaves. Those oppressed. They are the reason of the gospel. Therefore, the biblical text must not be put in palaces. The biblical text must not be put in parliaments. It must not be put in the banks, in the hands of the oppressors. The biblical text must be put in the hands of those that are being oppressed, those are, that are being disadvantaged, those that are being colonized, those that are being dehumanized. The gospel must come as good news. Aha. There we go now. It must be good news. That gives us hope. Not to endure the system, but to fight the system and change it for the better that it is. For when the, the, the text says, in the last days, those who shall collect their, 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 collect their freedom, they, they, they will not ask for it. They will take it with power. They take it by force. Because your freedom is never donated to you by the oppressor. The oppressor will never donate freedom until you take it violently from those that are taking it away from you. Then they come around, no, Maponga, you are inciting violence and etc. Shut up a, li a, a little bit and listen. I'm not inciting any violence. If democracy was the best way of governance, then why did we have to fight for it? If the colonialists knew that the best form of governance is democracy, <laughs> how many wars later, the whole of Africa fighting for democracy, and yet it's the right form of governance. Now you know, it's a joke of the highest order to be walking around Africa and telling us that European governance systems are perfect for Africans. That is not true. We have our own way of governing ourselves. And European governance systems are not interested in African culture. So we need to decolonize God, not only as a concept, but even as a picture. We need to decolonize him and begin to say, can you draw unkulunkulu? 
Can you draw Gainyame? Can you draw Mvelingangi? And as Africans, we must apply ourselves and say, what sort of picture do we come up with? And just when you're about to draw, then the Bible tells you, don't make yourself any grieving image, for you cannot liken me to anything else. Worship me in truth and in spirit. Therefore, we understand that we are dealing with, an, with, with, with something that is spiritual, not something that is physical. And many Christians, some of you are watching me right now, you are mad. You're getting angry. You're getting waked up. Because I'm saying that I don't believe in a white Jesus with blue eyes. No, you cannot say that. You are denying Jesus. Why did you allow the white people to make a white idol and you never complained? Now I'm saying it, you are getting angry. Why are you angry? You are not angry with me. You are angry with yourself. That you have been lied to for a long time. And for the first time, you meet information on your face. And it's causing lots of what we call here psychological misunderstanding, cognitive dissonance in a more professional psychological language. It's your own conflict in your own mind with your own belief system. Decolonize God. Number two decolonize humanity we cannot be taken only as africans who don't have a soul we are africans we are al kebalam we are bantu and for this reason when they tell us that you are slaves you are less than nothing africans are animals africans are this africans are this this dehumanizes us and if we are to use the bible as a text it says we are created in the image of god and if therefore we are animals then god is an animal also if we are stupid, then God is stupid also. And if we are less than human, then God is also less than human. Because what we say, we are in the image of the one who created us. Then we look like the one who has created us. And he who insults me, insults the one who has created me and has made me to be what I am. Therefore, an African must also have permission to identify with a God that looks like him. Yes, Buddhas in China, they can talk to their own Buddha. And uh, <laughs> the white people can create their own Messiah also, that blue-eyed boy, and hang them around. That's for them. Yes. So what's wrong <laughs> if he's an African? And if it does not matter whether Jesus is black or white, then can we please have a Chinese one? <laughs> can we please have an Indian God also? Because it does not matter. Then all of a sudden, no, no, we cannot make him anything except white. Then you are giving white people an unnecessary privilege to terrorize the rest of us with their white concept of superiority, which translates itself into politics. We shall conclude there. Then thirdly, we need to decolonize and deconstruct the Messiah, the whole picture of Jesus. If you have a Jesus in your house, a white picture of a Jesus in your house, please burn it. That's a demon that is in your house. If you have a book that has a white picture of a white Jesus on it, please burn that book. Those are white demons. If you have a small little cross on your neck that is hanging with a white Jesus on it, that small little blue-eyed boy, burn it. That is a demon you are carrying in yourself. And we cannot as black people be calling on white demons to oppress us and evoking them calling these white spirits to come and have superiority over us. The true God of the Bible was not a white man. Madagascar is 100 and something, 200 kilometers away from Africa. It's part of Africa. Yet North Africa, which is Israel, is separated by the Suez Canal and is not part of Africa. And this canal was dug a few days ago. Are, are, you, are you okay in your head? We are on the same platonic stone, Africa and Middle East. And God created a garden east of Eden. Therefore, Africa is Eden. We need to decolonize this Jesus story and throw away a white Jesus with his idols. With his, we do, I don't believe in a white movie star from Hollywood who is, who is supposed to have come around and saved me from my sins. How can a white boy with blue eyes die for Africans when they cannot even share land with us? Show me one white man who has died for a black man. Show me one white man. 25 million people dead in the sea on their way to America for slavery. 15 million people dead in Congo. 25 plus 15, 40 million plus people dead. And all their blood means nothing except the blood of a white boy. If you are going to do theology, do it correctly. Do it correctly and give me an option. 
If I want to believe in a white Jesus, I'll believe in a white Jesus. If I want to believe in a black Jesus, I'll believe in a black Jesus. But if you want to be true to the biblical text, then be honest as theologians. And I'm embarrassed to be sitting here as a theologian together with some of my theological friends who have gone to school to study. And when you come out of school to study, we actually continue to promote the wrong theology and push it in front of our own people. We have become the colonizers ourselves, Uncle Toms, who are sitting on the conscience of our people. Which is wrong. Which is wrong. How do you sleep at night taking money from widows and orphans? How do you sleep at night taking money from people who cannot afford food and bread because Jesus will bless them? For the past 15 years they've been giving their offerings to you and their lives have not changed. What is the problem? Because you don't have faith. You don't have faith. When I'm fundis, do you have faith in collecting money from us? So we need to understand and deconstruct the whole picture and ideology of this white messiah. And as long as we worship a white messiah, my submission to you is that we are not worshiping the truth of the text. This is an academic exercise we're doing here. If you want to be true to the text, please, I bought a can of Coke. Can I drink the Coke? Can I drink the Coke? Don't tell me, just drink, just drink as long as you are drinking. Uh-uh. I said I want coke. Therefore, remove the unnecessary iconography. And when you get more academic and you study the Kemetic religion to find that issues of the Trinity, the mother and son, the tree, all these things are actually way found in Kemet before even the Bible was written. And the Kemetic history is older than the Bible. But then I leave to you who are academicians. Since Jesus grew up in Egypt, who, when he came back to teach them after 12 years, from which school was he coming from and who had taught him? That's for you who are more, more, more advanced in your spaces of study to now to do a comparative study between the biblical text and Kemetic text and see the similarities and authenticate which one is older than the other. Then position your theology correctly. That's what life is all about. And ultimately, when you come, when you come there, you, decol you decolonize God, decolonize humanity, decolonize the Messiah, decolonize salvation. Stop selling, stop selling religion. Stop selling hope to the people. Give people practical solutions. Buy farms. How do you buy a factory and then convert it into a church and people come inside and they're praying for employment? <laughs> buy the factory. Create jobs. Then from the money from the factory, you can build a church. That's common sense. We need to deconstruct, decolonize the church. And we stop being centers, centers of embarrassment, centers of shame, centers of debauchery, centers of mischief, centers of licentiousness, centers of witchcraft, centers of perjury, and centers of corruption in the name of religion. And you don't want it to be spoken about, by the way. Ministers get very touchy. They get very touchy. They don't want it to be spoken about because you are bringing the body of Christ into disarray. There's no body of Christ that is so rotten and evil like this. We need to fix these things as Africans because Christianity has become a partner of colonialism. I'll say it again. Christianity has become a partner of colonialism. Why am I saying that? Because after colonizing, colonizing us, they were drinking coffee together. They never stood to oppose colonialism. They were benefiting from it. All your cities here have churches that are standing. The church right now in Africa owns more land than many businesses. Because they were in harmony with the government. May we have some land, please? They were given land. May we have some land? They were given land. Did they even condemn that what they were doing was wrong? The church was benefiting. Even now, there are churches that are still benefiting from colonialism. I'm not ashamed to say this. Even the church that I come from, my own church, is still running on the lines of segregation. Whites worship alone, blacks worship alone. We cannot even unite because of racism. The racism, is it biblical? No, it's not biblical. But the church will not stop it because it is founded on the principles of racism and segregation. And now all of a sudden, some other white man from Europe wants to come and run, and run a seminar in Britain of how we must manage racism. How can a racist come and teach us how not to become racist? How can a colonizer come and tell us how to decolonize ourselves? How do you have a conversation with yourself as an abuser of the system? Now you want to come and tell people how to manage and tolerate abuse. How can you be so narcissistic as an organization that you become so insensitive to the needs of the people that it is a conversation by yourself? 
You colonize the black people. You abuse the black people. You come around a few days later. You want to help the black people to tolerate and manage the colonialism that you gave to them. Are you okay in your head? Go back home, white man. Go back home. When you finish abusing a person, when a person is abused, the most horrible thing you can do after raping someone is, oh, let me help you to clean up. Please, leave me alone. You've done what you, want to, what you wanted to do. Can you just get away from here? Let me find love and comfort from people that care for me. And I'll clean up my wounds. And when I am finally clean, and I come back to you, and I want to deal with you, you did what you wanted to do, and you walked away. When I come back and I do to you what I want to do, you don't have the right of telling me what to do and what not to do. This is where colonialism and politics fail to understand. The colonialist came here. The oppressor came here. They took land, raped the women, destroyed the infrastructure, destroyed our culture, and everything else. Then they give you a democratic system with a constitution to help you to manage how to repair yourselves. We cannot tolerate that. You have done what you want to do as Europeans. Step aside. Allow us as black people to decide what we want to do with you. You can't be an abuser and be a judge of the same abuse again. Does this make sense, good people? Maybe I'm losing my mind, people. Help me here. Does it make sense? But, you see, life, my, my mind is quite sane. If you come to me and you give me a clout, quah, on my face, that's what you want to do. Me, I don't have enough, I don't have energy to waste. We're now in Shape Kampama, and you are done. Me, I'll just go behind me and take a stone. Because you can never judge how a person you have abused must react to your abuse. I'm even better I use a stone. Someone just take a gun. <laughs> you give me a clout, I take a gun, pah, I'm done with you. No, no, but me, I just clapped him and he shot me. Exactly, 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 in Kosa. exactly. When I, you thought that clapping me is the best you can do. When I'm retaliating, when I'm retaliating, you don't have authority of telling me how I should react. I'm a recovering abused child of Christianity. I'm recovering from the white Nonsense that had been pumped into my head from zero to 52. Waiting and hoping for this white guy to come and assist me. How do you sell me such a horrible thing all my life? And in the morning when I wake up and I say, I have had enough of this junk. No, you can't be saying that. You can't be, you can't be talking like that because you are, you are being insensitive. You, you, no, 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 no. Allow me, if I want to cry, let me cry. If I want to scream, let me scream. If you think I've lost my head and I've lost my mind, it's none of your business. Allow me to recover the way I want to recover. Even if I want to walk away from Christianity, it's none of your business. Why are you angry? Because you want to become a groupie. Oh, he's still with us. He's still with us. We're still with you where? Still with you where? When I'm with you, what difference does it make? I want to conclude by saying, I'm not saying leave Christianity. I'm not saying leave Islam. I'm saying all the instruments of religious meeting places must be converted into instruments of changing and transforming the society. We need, therefore, to deconstruct God, decolonize him. We need, therefore, to deconstruct and decolonize humanity, deconstruct Christianity, deconstruct the Christ Messiah himself, Deconstruct ecclesiology, church itself. Deconstruct ecclesiology and eschatology. Stop selling people things that are in the heavens because you have failed to make them relevant on earth. Teach people to work. The Bible says, occupy till I come. Work and labor, labor. We cannot teach escapism where people are waiting for the, for the clouds to open and they disappear to heaven. And by the way, many people want to go to heaven. They don't want to go to heaven because they are saved. By our Lord, too much debt. So they want to go disappear to heaven and they don't want to pay things that are here. Then I remember the other song by the other guy. When you get to heaven, you find the devil waiting for you. At Wena, you're not going in. Let's go backwards. You, are all, you cannot run away from earth because of debt. Oh, no, man, nothing except love. I have, we have been given land, we have been given crops, we have been given life. Let us make the best of what we have right now. Let heaven and theology be actually the blessing of a fruitful life in the now. 
then we can also wait for the second coming of Jesus with beautiful cars, with beautiful homes, looking nice also. Why must we be singing the song, take the world, but give me Jesus? You give away land and you, give, you receive Jesus. Hey, hey, I don't want, I don't want the Jesus. I want the land also and the Jesus. I want both. Why must I lose one? <laughs> Take the world, but give me Jesus. Ah, ah, ah. See, something is not right here. If you are bringing it, bring it together. <laughs> bring me the land. And then we can talk Jesus when I'm sitting on my land. That, for me, is common sense. And when our governments can begin to understand that the politics we are struggling with is actually theology. Because people, as they believe, they behave. Right now, when they are looking at you, Church is one of the biggest political parties. Ask me why do I say that? Because it disengages people from common events of the community. They have nothing to do with the government. They have nothing to do with anything else. All they love is Jesus. And this is the thing of women, by the way. Me, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. You can never say you love your husband. You can never say you love your, you love your children. But you love Jesus. I love Jesus with all my heart. You are going to be miserable the rest of your life. They come to us. I've been left with the bishop for years. Women come to us here. They kneel in front of us. Hey, bishop, bishop. Hey, stop wasting my time kneeling in front of me. Go and kneel in front of your own husband. How can you only try to be nice to pastors and you're not nice to your own homes? And these churches also, I have a problem with you. I have a problem with you as churches. You open a church on Sunday from 9 o'clock. Up to 7 in the evening. Monday morning is choir practice. Tuesday morning is youth meeting. Wednesday is women's meeting. Thursday is retirement people. Friday is community work at church. Saturday is, is cleaning up the church. Sunday, wh wh when are you going to work? When are you going to work? And then you pray that the Lord will bless you. Hey, Manesh, you will die with hunger. You will die with hunger. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. Six days. Go to work. It's actually according to the Bible. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. Then on the seventh day rest. I like that part there. Therefore it's illegal to rest on the seventh day when you have not labored for six days. <laughs> You're a criminal sitting in a church. How do you rest when you have not worked? You must work first. Then you can rest. Simple theology. You don't need mathematics to understand this. So when you begin to deconstruct and decolonize these things, we need to understand that what we are now calling Christianity, what we call truth, is not truth. People sit around talking about the Holy Spirit, the last one. People talk about the Holy Spirit and, 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 and talking about, uh, no, uh, you, you need to accept the Holy Ghost. You need to accept the Holy Ghost in your life. And, and you look around and say, what Holy Ghost? No, because when, when, the, Holy Ghost is, when the Holy Spirit is you, and this Spirit only comes when it hears white music. Then you want to start asking yourself the question. If this Jesus and this Holy Spirit cannot deal with a black man, they have a problem with the black man. They have a problem with the way he dresses. <laughs> they have a problem with his medicine. They have a problem with his music. They have a problem with his fashion. They have a problem with his language. They have a problem with his spirituality. You know, everything that is black is actually wrong. Then before you become a Christian, then uh, you appear there in your traditional clothes as an African. And then they look at you with those funny eyes, like, <clears throat> and they don't even point at you. They're just knocking each other. Check this one here. <laughs> look at this one. Who is here? Then by, after the service, they come to you very nice, uh, wiping their hands with the Holy Spirit. Hey, hey, my brother, um, can we meet you this side? Then the other one is donating his jacket. The other one is donating his shirt. The other one is donating his shoes and other things. And after they've given you all these donations, and then you are dressed up nicely, they say, ah, you see now, this, this, this is the blessing. The Holy Spirit has worked. Because in your mind, God cannot accept an African as he is. He must firstly be detoxed of being an African to becoming a European. And when he has become European, this is the trend of thought. Then God can accept him. Because if he comes as he is, he will traumatize the angels. The whole heaven will run through the windows. Because the African 
is unacceptable. That's what you're saying. I've been to churches, for example, people are singing and they're happy, and then the Abafundis come there in a nice straight line. Yeah. <clears throat> Stop now singing these uh, African choruses. Uh, open, open a hymn book now. Let us sing the official hymn. Amazing grace, how sweet, how sweet, okay, now we are at church. What, 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 what sort of salvation are you talking about? Which God can only answer, which God can only attend when people are speaking in the language of another. The other day I was laughing with my friends at a more lighter note. I said, you know why many of you ladies are, are single for a very long time? Because every time you kneel down to pray, Oh Lord, please, may I have a husband? Oh Lord, please, may I get married? In the name of Jesus, I pray, Amen. When you say Amen, someone is getting married in England. Because God never heard the prayer. You are praying in English. I mean, if your God cannot understand <laughs> your traditional local language, then he never created you. We need, therefore, as Africans in the 21st century, to deconstruct the way we look into theology. And the other day I'll come and do a nice full lecture on African spirituality to balance it with the Christian spirituality, which I've just explained. Then we can put the two together and then we can begin to call other pastors and talk what this concept of deconstruction. What goes into this deconstruction? What are we decolonizing as Africans? And there's no way we can be putting on these collars of Rome. No way we can be celebrating those big heads from Rome. No way. We're going to be carrying these heavy rosaries from Rome. No way. We're going to be kneeling in front of white idols and white images. No way. That we're going to be carrying around, reading books that are full of white men and they're busy colonizing us over. And we say we believe in Jesus. And then they send me in boxes. Do you still believe in Jesus? Do you still believe in Jesus? Hey, for the last time, I don't believe that a white man died for me. I don't believe that. The blue-eyed man with some blonde little hair. He must go back to hell where he comes from. He is not a savior of the world. He is a colonizer of the Europeans. Until we find the true Messiah of the Bible, please, only then can me and you have a conversation. Here on your program, Sankofa, with your host Maponga J, rumbling around the greater ecclesiastical and theological space construction here on Sankofa looking backwards at the future. We shall also extend a little bit on the Ethiopian space and see if Christianity was here with the white people or it was here with the Africans prior to that. That's a conversation for another day. But from me for today, Maponga JJ Garamboko Garamashamba Huda Chirara Nava Nava Ivanji Wanachi Garamabu Kima Tanda Novora Tisu Wanachi Ramba Kusesura Mpona Ngo Kuba Mtambu Riparu Wari Wana Matanga Kugara Wanachi Garamabu Kima Tanda Novora Until we see you again, Wira Miti Yaso Sechi Were Shoko Embere Ka Ponga Jay, we shall be talking again on your program. Sangofa, have yourself a wonderful evening. Don't do what I 